Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's edition of PatCast. Today is uh, September 20th, 2022, and I'm Rifat Manan in California, and I'm remotely joined by my good friend Emilio Madrigal, who is in Boston. Today, we are delighted to welcome back Dr. Deepti Dhal, who is Professor of Pathology at University of Alabama at Birmingham. And today, she is going to give a talk on GI pathology and one very important topic that is always a problem for practicing GI pathologists wherever we are. And the title of her talk is IBD related dysplasia, a practical approach to diagnosis. So as always, feel free to post your questions or comments on Facebook and YouTube chat windows, and uh, we will pass them on to Dr. Dhal at the end of the talk. And as you are aware that uh, today's talk uh, is accredited for CME credit by City of Hope. And I just want to share a little instruction about how to get the C CME credit. So, so this is how you get it. So first of all, you have to register at the City of Hope website if you have not done yet. And once you, once you uh, register there, I will share the code for to get the CME credit towards the end of the lecture. And, and if you are joining from United States, you can text the code to this phone number as you see on the screen. And if you are joining from outside of the United States, you can uh, email the code to this email address that is CME at COH.org. And please remember that the CME credit is available only during the live lecture. So please do not send the code after the live lecture, then it will not be available. So, but please remember that you have to register to the CME website. And with that, over to you now, Dr. Dahl. Thank you for joining us today. Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining in. So today I'm going to talk about uh, dysplasia and IBD. I think the presentation is stuck. All right, so I have no disclosures. And this is a slide I need to provide for CME. So today we are going to talk about a little bit of IBD surveillance and management of dysplasia in a few minutes, because we have, as pathologists, when we give a diagnosis of dysplasia, we have to understand uh, what does it uh, mean for the patient. Um, a significant part of my talk, I will cover histologic features of dysplasia, especially the non-conventional phenotypes, uh, which has been uh, uh, in recent literature and its associated challenges. Uh, and throughout the talk, I will show you P53 immunostain, uh, which uh, is, seems to be a helpful marker in, uh, in difficult or challenging cases. And if we have time uh, towards the end, we'll talk about some molecular features of dysplasia, which could be our future. So we all know that the risk of colorectal carcinomas is increased in IBD patients. And at the present time, dysplasia is the best marker for synchronous or metachronous uh, colorectal carcinomas in IBD patients. The risk is similar in UC, ulcerative colitis, and Crohn's disease of similar duration. And the surveillance biopsies usually start after eight years of disease. Uh, the peak age of cancer is, is young. Uh, as you can see, one third patients are less than 40 years old when they're diagnosed with carcinoma. And most importantly for us, the highest risk are in those patients who have associated primary sclerosis and cholangitis and who have persistent disease activity and patients who have IBD onset at young age. Now, most of the dysplastic lesions are endoscopically visible, but a subset of them, 20% of them are invisible, which is basically captured just on biopsies, random biopsies. So there has been dramatic change over 20 years. Uh, in 2010, um, the uh, American Gastroenterology uh, Society uh, developed these surveillance guidelines, which is it starts after eight years of IBD, 
It's repeated every one to three years. And when the patients are diagnosed with PSC, the surveillance biopsy start at the time of diagnosis. And when I was a, a fellow or uh, in my beginning years of my career, we used to really struggle with these cases. Every time we saw dysplasia, we had to figure out, is this a flat lesion or a polypoid lesion? And if it is a sporadic adenoma or so-called DOM, which is dysplasia associated lesion or mass, and it really caused a lot of heartburn because there were no good features to differentiate sporadic adenoma from DOM. And I think it really helped us a lot when these scenic recommendations came in 2015. And scenic stands for uh, surveillance for colorectal endoscopic neoplasia internal international consensus. So this was an international consensus recommendations. And most of this work, which was the pathologist problem, it actually now became an endo endoscopist problem where the dysplastic lesions, they're basically divided. They're, are they visible or they're invisible? And vis invisible lesions were also referred to as flat dysplasia. And if the visible lesion was endoscopically resectable, you resect the lesion. If it's complete, and they need to do histologic confirmation whether it's complete or not. That was another problem because sometimes they, get, they used to give fragments of this plastic lesion. Um, so this was a problem for a while, and uh, but they had needed histologic confirmation. And if it's endoscopically completely resected, then surveillance continued. And if it's endoscopically non-resectable, patients underwent colectomy. For invisible one, it was. Um, the, the recommendations were the first, it needs a second opinion from a GI, cons, uh, GI pathology consultant. And once it's confirmed that it is indeed a dysplastic area in a random biopsy, then rather than uh, resection, uh, it used to be followed by, it's followed by high resolution endoscopy. And if there is high grade dysplasia in a follow up biopsy, then, and it's in a follow-up biopsy, if it's still invisible and it's high-grade dysplasia, colectomy. And I just saw these guidelines that were updated in 2021. So the, what I noticed, there's not much changes from the 2015. And this is a diagram they, they showed in 2021, also in the 2015. So for us to understand the visible dysplastic lesions, they're either polypoid or non-polypoid. And polypoid ones can be pedunculated or cissile. And the non-polypoid ones, if you see the non-polypoid are also referred to as flat lesions. So they are still endoscopically visible and respectable lesions many times. And of course, the invisible is one is caught in a random biopsy. So the only updates was in this that, um, first of all, to, uh, these endoscopic biopsies should be done. The dysplasia detection should be done in quiescent phase of the disease. And when they see a lesion, they are just required to do endoscopic resection or endoscopic resection is preferred over biopsies. And remember in 2015, the guideline was to obtain histologic confirmation. Now it's not necessary. So they, it is up to them to figure out whether they resected it completely or not. So here are some management guidelines. If, um, so if it's a less than two CM resectable lesion, and if it's completely resected, continued surveillance. If it is a larger lesion, it needs intensive, and if it's resected, it still needs intensive surveillance. Intensive surveillance means every three to six months, to go back every three to six months. If unresectable, surgery. If, if invisible, confirm the diagnosis by an expert pathologist. If there's inflammation, treat inflammation, and then perform this high-resolution endoscopy. Now, on high-resolution endoscopy, if this persistent high-grade or multifocal invisible dysplasia, then do surgery. And if you look for persistent unifocal low-grade invisible dysplasia, so if it's a single focus of dysplasia, or there's no histologic dysplasia on a repeat endoscopy, it's a similar in a surveillance, which is intensive surveillance every three to six months, which is quite a lot for a patient. And the surveillance continues every one to three, one to five years, depending on the severity of the disease. And there are other clinical factors, um, how they do these surveillance on these patients. 
So just to summarize again, we divide lesions, dysplastic lesions into visible or invisible. If it's resectable and if it's less than 2 cm, if we see high-grade dysplasia in that, the surveillance is intensive, three to six months. If it's low-grade dysplasia, depending on the size, it's one to two year. If it's greater than 2 cm or if any complex lesion, the data for these lesions is not very clear and it's, uh, it's, re it's recommended intensive surveillance. One resectable lesion surgery and the same thing for invisible lesion. Confirm it, do high resolution. If we still see high-grade dysplasia surgery and if it's multifocal low-grade dysplasia surgery, but if it's unifocal low-grade dysplasia, it's surveillance in three to six months. So what is a biopsy diagnosis importance? What, what does it mean? So actually it has changed a lot. If you see the older literature, if we make a biopsy diagnosis, the five-year probability of developing high-risk lesion or high-grade dysplasia or carcinoma was around 50% in some studies. But if you look at recent literature, it is actually pretty lower. So this is the study, this is well quoted. In this, in this study, they looked at these surveillance cohort studies and the, if the biopsy diagnosis of low-grade dysplasia, the annual incidence of colorectal carcinoma was less than 1%. And in the surgical cohorts for these patients with di biopsy diagnosis of low-grade dysplasia, the prevalence of cancer was around 17%. But most importantly for us, um, when we make a biopsy diagnosis, we should realize that the incidence of low-grade dysplasia is higher in PSC patients. And, the, and it is higher, dysplasia progression is higher when the lesion is invisible, and also when the lesion is in distal location and it's multifocal. And this is another a recent paper just to show you that the, the prognosis of these IBD dysplasias have improved actually. So for visible or invisible high-grade dysplasia, the incidence of cancer is around slightly higher than 10%. While for low-grade dysplasia, the incidental simplest cancer is around 2%. Okay, now about histologic features, how it is defined. It is defined as unequivocal intra neoplasia. So we have to be, we have to know for sure what we are looking is neoplastic in nature. And most of them are cytologic criteria. So as usual, hyperchromatia, high NC ratio, crowding of nuclei, overlapping, and isocytosis, just any cytologic features we look for any dysplastic process in GI tract. Um, apparent differentiation actually helps us in diagnosing dysplasia, especially when we don't see the distinction between goblet cells and enterocytes, or the excessive columnar mucinous cells or the goblet cells look very funny, dystrophic goblet cells, or there are too many panel cells. And yes, they can have variable architecture, as we are going to see. So the problem in these diagnosing of dysplasia in IBD patients is, is mainly how to differentiate them from reactive epithelium. And these are the conventional criteria we use. When we see maturation towards the surface, we feel we feel comfortable is most likely reactive, or when it's a sharp focus versus it's merging gradually, that favors reactive. When there's a lot of inflammation, we have to think of reactive. Um, and when there's uniform atypia, tends to be more reactive. But in, real, in reality, you may have seen that all these features are by themselves really not very specific for reactive changes. In fact, all of this I see in this plastic lesions too. And I'm going to show you a lot of pictures here. So just to um, um, go back to the history, all this classification of this plastic lesion in IBD was led by Dr. Riddell. And in 1983, he published in the, with the IBD morphology study group, where they divided this plastic uh, in, into low-grade, high-grade, and indefinite. Let's go over the criteria for indefinite for dysplasia. So, of course, it's not a particular category. Indefinite is when we cannot make a distinction between reactive or dysplastic. And, and when do we do that? When there are concerning worrisome features in the basal crypts, but with surface maturation, because we all like to see surface dysplastic changes since surface maturation is feature of reactive changes. So, but it's, when it's atypical, it's really bothersome and it's not on the surface, that's one criteria. Secondly, when we see worrisome features, when there's a lot of inflammation or ulceration, we have to be careful. 
making dysplasia diagnosis. And also we can use indefinite for dysplasia when it's uninterpretable for technical reason. And what those could be? Tangential sectioning, which is very common, at least in my hospital, and when we can see the surface, and when there's a severe artifact, which makes histologic assessment difficult. I feel better with this criteria. So uh, this is from the original paper. This, these are the reasons when, when we can call any very atypical biopsies as indefinite for dysplasia. And if you remember the guidelines, even when you diagnose low-grade dysplasia in a biopsy or no histologic dysplasia, the surveillance is intensive. So it, it's the same thing for indefinite. They do intensive surveillance uh, in these patients where we make diagnosis for indefinite for dysplasia. So low-grade dysplasia. Yeah, I think the key feature of low-grade dysplasia is, to me is maintaining nuclear polarity, just like what we use for adenoma in a non-IVD patient. So these are very conventional intestinal type dysplasia we are seeing here where the nuclei are confined to the base and they are hyperchromatic, stratified with apoptotic debris, larger nuclei if you compare with normal. And that's high-grade dysplasia. Now here, even though we see ulceration, we see there's a, there's a loss of nuclear polarity in these areas. There are crowded cribs, there's sort of crib reforming. Um, atypical mitotic figures, if you see, and marked nuclear pleomorphism. And I, I like to see architectural changes. It, it helps me in making diagnosis of hybrid dysplasia. Um, this is a case I recently had. It was a completion proctectomy. I'm looking at it. We, you know, most of the time they are reactive changes, and I'm saying, wow, there's no architectural atypia, but look at the surface. There, there, there's loss of nuclear polarity. And then I'm wondering, and I look in the history, the patient, this patient had multifocal low-grade dysplasia, and this is the high power. So I think I can convince you even on the surface and the nuclei getting a little bit larger, they're losing their polarity apart from nuclear pleomorphism. And of course I did P53. And what, what is P53 positivity? It's if you see homogeneous, strong, moderate to strong staining, mostly in the cribs, diffuse should be diffuse homogeneous staining to be supportive of the diagnosis of dysplasia. I felt better that this P53 is supporting the diagnosis of high-grade dysplasia. So um, I think we'll all feel better by looking at this slide, uh, how reproducible we are. And actually we are not very good. If you see from 1988, the kappa was 0.41. In 2002, Dr. Orr did at 0.43. And Dr. Alpert in 2021, she still came up with this similar kappa value, 0.42. And it's interesting, even the agreement among subspecialist GI pathologists is just fair to moderate. So people should feel better about it. Um, and inter-observer agreement was not high between experienced GI pathologists. But let me remind you, this paper was specifically focused on challenging and difficult cases. So maybe a kappa value is better than what is reported. And this is in these cases, there were poor agreement when there was mucosal atrophy. And I like this areas of stark contrast. I find when I look at these IBD biopsies and when there are different looking areas, it bothers me. Is it dysplasia? Because why I'm seeing a very different area? Is it clonal? And I will show you some examples. And of course, serrated appearance, whenever the biopsy is serrated, it, has, it, it can create a problem. And of course, with goblet cell depletion too, because that can be seen in reactive and dysplastic areas. So what, what is so unique about dysplasia in IBD patients? We all know if we see surface maturation, we feel comfortable, it's reactive. But in my experience, many dysplastic cases in IBD have some funny surface maturation. Look at this. There is, I would argue there's surface maturation in this one. And I would argue this one is dysplastic. This was P53 positive. There's surface maturation here as well. So I think surface maturation may occur, but of course we have to be careful about that. And it's always difficult interpretation, even though they do biopsies in poison disease, um, they are often inflamed uh, whenever we diagnose dysplasia. So this is, again, the usual, very typical adenoma-like conventional or intestinal type dysplasia. So now let's talk about what is non-conventional or non-adenomatous. Now, a lot of credit I will give it to Dr. Choi. He's at UCSF. You can see the references here. 
A lot of papers are written by Dr. Choi and Dr. Lovers. They, they, and it's it's all it's pretty recent. And the only entity I um, I am well, well aware of is hypermucinous dysplasia. We we have seen some cases like this. It's rare. I think all these all these dysplasia or the variants um, to me, it's all it's all morphologically different. And we're going to sh I'm going to show you pictures to explain to you all this. But hypermucinous. So one is hypermucinous dysplasia, then is crypt cell dysplasia and goblet cell deficient dysplasia, and then they're all serrated dysplasias. Notice I did not put dysplasia with increased panic cells, and I will explain to you. So let's talk about hypermucinous dysplasia. Actually, this was first described in 1999. Um, so it's not a very new entity. It's, it's uncommon, and, these, uh, and in this paper, they talked about seeing KRS mutations in this and they, so they, so these lesions, they are often polypoid, so that's helpful. It looks like a lesion, but a subset of them may present as a flat in a random biopsy. And characteristically, they have gastric formula features. It looks like gastric type mucin. The crypt cell dysplasia and goblet cell deficient dysplasia, the characteristic about them is they are usually invisible. So they are not described with dysplastic lesion. And then there are serrated dysplasia, which is SSL-like sessile serrated lesion, traditional serrated adenoma-like, and which cannot be either characterized as SSL or TSA. So think about serrated lesions, they are mostly visible. And whatever studies have been done, they are similar to their sporadic counterparts. And we'll talk about it. So here, until now, these descriptions of all these hypermucinous, it was the it was not clear what does it mean actually. But then there was this paper in 2021 from Dr. Choi's group that they said that these dysplasia are more frequently associated with advanced neoplasia than conventional dysplasia. So that's a pretty significant finding for me. Um, And then there was another paper this year, which Dr. Stoy shared with me. And again, this is, the, this is a multi-institutional study. And they, uh, they had these three different subtypes, hypermucinous, goblet cell depression, and crypt cell dysplasia. And they said they're often associated with invisible appearance. So you will see these often with when in a random biopsy. And again, the similar conclusion that they are associated with advanced neoplasia on follow-up. So let's talk about this study, the first study in 2021. This is the single institutional study. They had, they took 300 dysplastic lesions. And if you notice here, 90% of them were conventional dysplasia. So only 30% were them for non-conventional dysplasia. And then he, in this study, among non-conventional dysplasia, he had this category of dysplasia with increased panel cells, which and they, they had the most cases of this. And these are other dysplasia, which I just described, just few cases in tense, you know, very rare, hypermucinous seven cases. And the, the important conclusion of this study was that they, they Dr. Choi is very good with this enupoloidy, uh, you know, they, they, he says enupoloidy is more common in these non-conventional dysplasia. To me, the most important clinical significance was that they were saying that more, these dysplasias are more likely to develop hybrid dysplasia or colorectal carcinoma and the, with the significant p-value. So these are the pictures from his paper. So this is dysplasia with increased panel cells, a lot of panel cells in this, um, um, in this. But even to me, every all of us will diagnose this dysplasia because minus pen itself, it actually looks like dysplasia. So, I don't think we will miss this as dysplasia. This would be just dysplasia with increased panel cells. Actually, this subgroup in his study was similar to conventional dysplasia. So I'm not sure whether this is considered, this should be, if this is treated as non-conventional, but all of us practicing pathologists, we, would, we should be able to identify this just by the nuclear features that this is dysplasia. Now, this is the tricky part. And I think it's very classic. It's, it's actually really hypermucinous. We see lots of mucin here. Uh, this is from his paper. And see the gastric foveolar type mucin. It's actually hard to identify this is coming from colon. And if we look at the atypia, there is not much atypia on this, especially on the surface. You have to really go and look at the base of the cribs. And the base of the cribs look atypical. 
This is another uh, example from this uh, multi-institutional study. Similar example looks, look like, looks like it's the same case. Lots of mucin, lots of foveolar type epithelium, and the atypia would be prominent at the base. So you see almost like a surface maturation in these lesions. And this is a case I had where it was a polypoid lesion, lots of mucinous epithelium. We don't see goblet cells there. Every cell has mucin in it. And the atypia is right here at the base. You see these there, there's nuclear pleomorphism. That's, and if you compare with this, the surrounding mucosa, this, this atypia really stands up. Let's talk about Krebs cell dysplasia. I find this the hardest, um, hardest to, um, to figure this out. This is, this is a, from his paper actually in 2019. They described 14 cases and wow, look at the, the there is no architectural atypia in this. In fact, they are defined as no significant architectural atypia. So all it was defined by the presence of nuclear atypia at the base. And this is maybe impressive because if we are used to looking at crypt bases, this has some sort of hyperchromatic nuclei, larger nuclei, maybe a little bit more mitotic figure. And he did show P53 staining on these lesions, which is strong, diffuse, and homogeneous staining. And he found these are enupoloid cases. So this is how they define crypt cell dysplasia. And, um, and this is goblet cell deficient dysplasia where Back to Krebs cell deficient dysplasia, there's surface maturation. These are defined by surface maturation. And I think similar thing is described in Badit's esophagus, very difficult diagnosis to make, I believe, unless you have P53 um, supporting stain. Um, we'll show, show you several examples. And these are the goblet cell deficient dysplasias. Uh, it's been talked about. Fewer cases, 10 cases in 2021 paper, only two cases in this multi-institutional study. Now, the, it's defined as loss of goblet cells or almost loss of goblet cells. In a high-grade dysplasia one, again, it's like dysplasia with pain itself. I think all of us will diagnose this as dysplasia because it looks atypical, right? Um, but if with the low-grade dysplasia, when you have complete loss of goblet cells, and then you can argue how much nuclear atypia you need to call this as dysplasia. And I think this can be very tricky, the second picture. These pictures are from his papers. Now, this paper I want to talk about this recent, this year when it was um, published. This is multi-institutional study. They had 126 cases. Now, these are the only three types that described. They did not talk about with pain itself, um, the dysplasia with pain itself, because it behaves like conventional dysplasia. They have good number of cases over here. If you see quite a number of cases they found, and important to know, most of them are low grade by, uh, by uh, H&E. There's no high grade dysplasia in them. And if you do P53, they reported less than 50% of cases with P53 overexpression. So again, morphology is a gold standard. And the striking part is in their study, they found 60% cases, they were associated with subsequent detection of high grade dysplasia of carcinoma with a mean follow-up of 12 months. But my, I, when I was looking and reading at this paper, um, a subset of at least 50% of these cases were also had conventional dysplasia. So important thing would be to see how many of these cases without conventional dysplasia develops hybrid dysplasia or carcinoma. I'm sure more will come. Regarding P53, always remember histology is the gold standard. And what we did, as I showed you a lot of pictures, lots homogeneous, diffuse, strong staining, especially in the crypt, entire crypt axis. I have noticed you don't see P53 staining on the surface epithelium, which goes with the surface maturation in these dysplastic cases. And why P53 is important? If in the molecular studies, P53 alterations is an early event in IVD. And I will show you uh, the, some uh, 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 diagram about that. It is very important which antibody you use. In the literature, clone DO, DO7 is described. We have a different antibody. It's from Roche, P53. It works well for us. So again, this is the mutant pattern staining I'm showing you, and we'll show you what is normal pattern in the subsequent pictures. What is normal pattern? It's weak staining. You can have some moderate staining, but the most important is it's heterogeneous staining, not homogeneous like this. 
and you can take help of this in difficult cases. It has helped me in difficult cases. My only problem of P53 is this. Can we get P53 staining in regenerative mucosa? And I'm going to talk about that in a moment. Always remember, you know, yes, homogeneous staining is important for diagnosing mutant pattern staining, but there's also so-called null pattern P53 staining when the dysplastic focus will be completely negative while the control, the background mucosa will show some scattered positivity. This is not IBD case, by the way. This is just Barrett's case with dysplasia. I just happened to see it and I needed to take a picture for the presentation. And I, I like this study from Dr. Abraham in 2014. These are, I, these are ischemic colitis cases. And she found, you know, we, we have seen ischemic colitis when there's so much regenerative atypia, it almost looks like low-grade dysplasia. And look at P53 positivity. So we can argue that P53 can be positive in a very reactive regenerative mucosa. That's why I think histology is the gold standard and not to trust P on P53 alone unless you have a good clinical setting and good morphologic evidence. Let me show you some of my challenging cases I struggled with in my 15 years of my career. This is the case we had longstanding UC. This, this biopsy is showing no goblet cells. This was in this left colon biopsy. First time we got it, we said, oh, this is discrete, different, very different looking. It's clonal. We call it low-grade dysplasia. But if you notice, the nuclei are pretty uniform. They are not stratifying. They are not, they are a little larger. So you can debate about whether this is true dysplasia or not. This is regenerative mucosa. At that time, this was 10 years back. And every time the biopsies are happening, every two years, three years, and similar appearance we are seeing in the same area. Is it, is it persistent? Yes. Has it progressed? Not yet. It is 10 years. Is it goblet cell deficient dysplasia? I don't know. I would still, I think it's preferred to still say indefinite for dysplasia. We don't know about this. And uh, it's still being diagnosed as indefinite for dysplasia. Interesting. For 10 years, we are seeing this kind of epithelium in this patient. And I'm curious to see what happens in the future. Case number two. Now, I got really super sensitive about hypermucinous epithelium. And I thought, wow, this is hypermucinous. There are no goblet cells. This looks like foveolar type. But to me, to call anything as mucinous or even think about dysplasia, I go to the base and I compare the base of these scripts and compare with the normal. And I thought this is pretty atypical with nuke. It's at least hyperchromatic. It's a uh, so to me, there were hypermucinous changes. Am I very confident in diagnosing hypermucinous dysplasia? Not, not really. This was a random biopsy. And in this patient, this another biopsy had conventional dysplasia, low-grade dysplasia. And as I said, all the studies of these non-conventional phenotypes, thankfully, had 50% have conventional dysplasia in their cases. So this patient had a history of multifocal dysplasia. And with this diagnosis of low-grade dysplasia in a flat biopsy. And I, of course, I was seeing hypermucinous epithelium and I was tempted to say there's hypermucinous dysplasia as well. And very likely that be hypermucinous dysplasia. This patient had colectomy at the other institution, so I don't, do not have to follow up. Just to go back to hypermucinous epithelium, that is hypermucinous epithelium too. But I didn't raise anything here because that's inflammatory polyp. And if you go high power, I don't see any atypia. In fact, the base of the eclipse are similar to other areas. So I, I wouldn't say hypermucinous epithelium indefinite for dysplasia. To me, the setting is very important. And I think these are very challenging cases. Luckily, we don't see them very often. This is case three, another hypermucinous epithelium. Here is the background mucosa. So now I'm comparing this background mucosa. Background mucosa looks very atrophic. And this to me, it's again, tangentially section, right? I don't see the surface very well, but still the atypia is bothering me. I said hypermucinous epithelium with atypia. I, I said indefinite for dysplasia. And that's the high power of this. I just didn't, even though I couldn't confirm its surface maturation, it was atypical enough in a different area. And another biopsy in this patient had these atypical crypts. Again, tangentially section. I don't see the surface, I did P53. I would think this is homogeneous staining for P53. 
I was we still didn't call it crypts or dysplasia. I went for crypts or atypia. These cases, we have a GI conference. I hope all of your institutions with difficult cases, you have uh, communication with the clinician. We talked about it. I told them it's, it's to me, I'm, I'm bothered about it. So they did surveillance biopsies every six months. And um, this is the same patient actually uh, after one year. And, and now I'm seeing, you could say, Cripsale atypia. Now this is, this is the background. I'm comparing the background mucosa with these glands. They look hyperchromatic to me. They're more mitotic figures. It is very hard to convince anybody, even myself, that this is crypt cell dysplasia. And that's the story right now. Oh, sorry about that. So um, the story is, this is the most recent biopsy I have and more to follow. I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen to this patient. So, so far we have been diagnosing indefinite for dysplasia and I'm sure we'll see a biopsy soon. Um, case four. Um, this, is a, this is another case. And this look at the crypt atypia. It stands out, right? This is this is a normal gland, normal here. They are very hypochromatic, stratified, increased mitotic figures. Perhaps this area is more atypical than the previous case. So this one I was pretty comfortable. I can call this crypt cell dysplasia. And look at P53 staining. Wow, right? It helps you stain crypt cell dysplasia. But I was a little disappointed when the patient had a, 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 an endoscopy and they did a thorough biopsy and there's nothing. But I am, I am curious uh, because there's this patient is gonna get biopsied every six months to see what happens to this patient. Because you know about this P53 stain, there is P53 staining described in patients with, uh, as a molecular event, right? It's an early event. Maybe this patient is at high risk of developing dysplasia or cancer. So more to see. Case number five. This is also interesting. As usual, surface is missing over here, but this is atypical. The problem is we all get very nervous. We all want to see surface maturation, but that degree of atypia bothers me a lot. It was called as indefinite for dysplasia. In the interdisciplinary meeting, we said, I said, I'm very worried for dysplasia. And then they listened to us sometime, follow up in one year, just look at this. There was extensive dysplasia in this, high grade dysplasia. So I think we can save these patients sometimes by, by just flagging the cases, by just saying indefinite if we are not, if we are not sure it's dysplasia. And that's the background mucosa for comparison. Another case, more difficult. I think there is hypermucinous. I'm not sure it's hypermucinous. It somewhat looks like it. There's some surface changes, looks slightly atypical, not 100% certain. That's the background for comparison. This also looks a little bit hypermucinous. And this is a high power. So if you compare this, it kind of looks clonal. Um, but we say uniform atypia is seen more in reactive. I do not see obvious uh, dysplastic changes. I'm comparing with normal. Again, comparing with normal, the nuclei is slightly larger. I was not sure, called it indefinite. And this is P53. This year, where there are surface changes, not obviously sure this is dysplasia, not sure if it's strong staining, maybe homogenous, moderate staining, maybe positive. I was not sure about P53 staining. This area where there's surface maturation, not very atypical, but different, but different than normal. It did stain. This is a normal mucosa here. This is patchy staining. This looks like homogenous P53 staining. Flag this case as indefinite for dysplasia. This is a follow up biopsy. Uh, polypoid area looks serrated, looks this plastic to me in comparison, and this is high power. So I think this is dysplasia. Again, actually that one, I remember that this one was still called indefinite for dysplasia. Uh, and now, I think now everybody can call this dysplasia. Now these biopsies are every six months, they are following these patients. So some of them are gratifying when you call them, when you think it's dysplasia, you're not confident. You call, you flag them as indefinite, you tell the clinician, and then the follow-up comes out as dysplasia. And this was a really nice case. All the colon biopsies showed this. You don't see any colonic mucosa, normal colonic mucosa here. Wow, I don't know what non-conventional phenotype it is. Maybe goblet cell poor. You don't see goblet cells here. And it's it's everywhere, it's similar. All biopsies look like this. They look like a funny reactive change, funny dysplasia changes. 
more biopsies here, you know, not you know, every biopsy look like this. And here they're on the right side, they're more pain itself. And, you know, we, need, we needed P53 for support here and P53 showing wild type stain. But there was so much, it didn't, it was so bothersome for atypia for multifocal dysplasia, and that's a follow-up resection on this case. And I think great case to understand the heterogeneity and how difficult these cases be. This polypoid area is obvious dysplasia for, um, for everybody, I guess. That's the hypermucinous area. And if you look at the background here, the base looks atypical than the surface, is surface maturation. That's, this is obvious um, dysplasia here. See the hypermucinous epithelium, gastric foveal time, no atypia here. But if you look at, so that's the conventional area. You could argue that goblet cell deficient dysplasia, obvious high grade dysplasia here. Here, look at the base of the hypermucinous epithelium, very atypical at the, not very atypical, atypical at the base. So that could be hypermucinous dysplasia for me with, uh, with the, uh, again, surface, surface changes and the base changes, just for comparison. And you can see the high power atypia changes. So I think this kid had a hypermucinous dysplasia, goblet cell deficient dysplasia, and that's the P53. It highlights beautifully that high-grade dysplasia. It also highlights this dysplasia, hypermucinous dysplasia. And maybe you could call this as crypt cell, crypt cell dysplasia here uh, uh, because of P53 staining. Uh, another case um, I have, yeah, I have to rush. This is a background mucosa, looks very atypical, but it's ulcerated, it's inflamed, it's architecturally very complex. And it looks very atypical, but I don't know, it could be reactive because it's so ulcerated. We did P53 homogenous staining. Now that could be a problem. I think this case was called low-grade dysplasia. Seriously, I'm not even sure what was this. It could be called as indefinite, it could be called low-grade dysplasia. The follow-up biopsies have been normal so far in that case. Uh, I'm going to skip this case um, about serrated lesions. To remember serrated, to, about there is there is a lot of literature about serrated lesions. What to remember is only serrated lesions with dysplasia they are considered as risk factors for subsequent uh, high risk uh, high grade dysplasia or carcinoma. So SSL, hyperplastic polyp, all these studies have shown that. Hyperplastic, these do not have increased incidence of dysplasia or cancer. So if these lesions, if serrated lesions have dysplasia, they have risk, they are risk factors for subsequent neoplasia. Only in 2016 paper, they said IBD patients with SSD may be at risk. So it's not definite. So for now, only lesions with dysplasia, they are higher risk factors for subsequent neoplasia. I, I would spend a, spend a minute in this serrated epithelial change. Um, it's been described in several papers. Now, the main pathologist, Dr. Parian from Johns Hopkins, this is different. This is not typically, it's an invisible lesion. It's not described in polyp as polyp. And that, this is goblet cell rich. Remember, goblet cell rich, it has to be full thickness and a lot of crypt architectural distortion and no nuclear atypia at all. So, it, so it's kind of very difficult diagnosis to make serrated epithelial change. The good thing is it's still not recognized by WHO and it's not widely accepted. So we're not supposed to diagnose these, but the, there is literature and the most recent literature from Dr. Parian, and it's a meta-analysis she did. And she found that these, these serrated epithelial changes especially in UC patients, they have a higher risk of developing neoplasia, synchronous or metachronous with p-value significant. But I get comforted by 2021 paper from Dr. Bass. He's saying the cancer risk is still low and it requires no change in surveillance. So don't feel bad about not diagnosing these. I think these are very tough um, to diagnose this myself. And, um, and the reason is why? Because we often see hyperplastic-like change, especially in left colon biopsies and long-standing IBD patients. Are these all sedated epithelial changes? Maybe we'll make an overdiagnosis. Um, and then in all these studies, they could not match this lesion directly to the dysplastic lesion at the same site. 
So that was the issue Dr. Batch raised with this kind of changes in the IBD patient. And of course, if we cannot agree to the dysplasia cases where our kappa value is low, imagine what's the kappa value going to be in for these serrated epithelial changes. But just for you to know that these changes have been described in AB, IBD patients, and there's a literature to support that even there's a molecular data actually from John Hopkins um, that these have a higher risk of developing um, dysplasia. These are the cases I had. This was a polyp. I felt better following SSL light lesion. This was a random biopsy. I thought it closely resembled serrated epithelial changes. I shared this with the people who have reported these and they agreed. And this is another case. Is it serrated epithelial change? I don't think so because to me, it's not goblet surface. Is this SSL light? I would not call SSL if this is a random biopsy. I think these are difficult cases and you know you can just have a communication with the clinician. Um, you know, this used to be a big deal, sporadic adenoma versus IBD associated dysplasia, not relevant according to CNET guidelines. I do think it has some significance though, because if you see a dysplastic lesion in a patient with IBD, with, have no, with, this, with no colitis in the background and had never had colitis, that could be a sporadic adenoma in an IBD patient. Because all these IBD patients are living long. We are doing good colonoscopic uh, examination in these. And IBD associated dysplasia, they have a different molecular phenotype. They, and they, they are associated with the field effect. There are lots of multifocal dysplasias in these patients. Are we ready for molecular markers? None. There is nothing for molecular use in clinical practice right now. But there is a lot of literature about DNA and eupoloidy. Uh, as I showed uh, uh, to you, lots of literature supporting that if you do enucleoidy, they may proceed or seen in dysplastic lesions. And about P53 somatic mutation. Um, and this is a beautiful pay, uh, diagram I found from 2018 paper. This is IBD associated dysplasia, CTP, CP53 mutation. It occurs actually before even low grade dysplasia occurs. And if you compare with these sporadic cancers, if you look at sporadic cancer, the P53 is a late event. If you see IBD associated cancer, it's P53 is occurring where there's not even dysplasia has occurred. So homogeneous P53 staining in an atypical area may mean dysplasia. Um, um, just a few sentences about IBD associated carcinomas. They are usual, but more proportionate. You see mucinous and signet ring cell cancers. Uh, there are more. Um, I, I, this is very fascinating to me, the low-grade tubuloglandular features. This is very important because they have no atypia, no desmoplastic stroma, and there's no dysplasia on the overlying mucosa. And you will wonder how to diagnose this. I think these are rare, and this is the case I encountered. There were these glands. First, I was thinking, oh, this is, could be cystica, glandica, the, the, the herniation process in IBD patients. There's no dysplasia here. But you know, this case had a positive lymph node. So this to me is a very well differentiated that below the, the type described by Dr. Harpas. And it's kind of, you can see this in IBD patient without overlying dysplasia. Um, always remember uh, strictures and Crohn's disease needs to be sampled. Uh, they are rare, but sometimes you see mucinous carcinomas in them. This is the recent case we had. We found this signet ring cell carcinoma, and this, of course, if you look carefully, there is dysplasia in the background mucosa. Not, to me, not high-grade dysplasia. So there is low-grade dysplasia here. You may not see intervening high-grade dysplasia in these cases. Again, remember fistulous tract, if you see mucin, very important to do deeper sections. You might see carcinoma in it, and that's one focus of cells you see in high power over here. So this was mucinous carcinoma, in a fistula in Crohn's disease. This is another signet ring cell cancer case in an IBD patient. And look at that hypermucinous epithelium. Is this hypermucinous dysplasia or it's reactive dysplasia or reactive mucinous epithelium? So here, here are my conclusions. Uh, I wanted everybody to understand how, what, it, what these surveillance guidelines, because you know, we stress too much on making diagnosis of dysplasia, how your diagnosis is important for patient management. So it's very important to know the clinical world, how they, how, how your diagnosis affects patient management. Uh, 
Yes, it is very important to recognize these non-conventional forms, uh, like different forms of dysplasia, not to be confused as reactive changes. Um, I know people don't believe this if there's no surface changes, not dysplasia, but I've shown you some examples of that. And of course, there's literature. Uh, that 2022 paper from Dr. Choi, he described 60% of these, they were associated with hydrate dysplasia or colorectal carcinoma. And so at least if we find cases, we are not sure, we can flag them as indefinite for dysplasia and we can do increased surveillance. We can tell the clinicians, please don't wait for one year, maybe do it in three to six months. Uh, and I, I totally agree if, if we are not convinced diagnosis of indefinite may be appropriate in these patients. Um, and I think I've shown you enough pictures to, um, about P53 that it can help us as, uh, as a marker, immunohistochemical marker, and molecular characterization um, uh, may help, uh, especially finding somatic mutations and even aneuploidy if we have those, uh, um, those methods to find out uh, in difficult cases. But currently, it's all in research. I think I'm going to end my talk here. Uh, I have my email over here. Uh, if I'm short of time, um, all the questions are welcome on an email. Um, and here I am. I'm going to start my video. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Dahl, for this excellent talk on a very practical topic uh, that we all face. And uh, thanks for all the teaching points that you have uh, so nicely uh, elucidated. Before we go to the Q&A session, so I would just like to uh, share about the CME activity once again with our viewers. Just give me one minute. So uh, the code is already there. You might have seen it on the chat box. And before you send the code, so you should make sure that you register for the CME activity at the City of Hope CME website that you can see here. And once you have registered, so you can send a code to either this phone number if you are watching from United States. And if you are watching from any country outside of the United States, you can email the code to this email address. And please make sure that you send the code only during the live lecture and it will be inactivated once the live lecture is over. And you will get an email from City of Hope to submit an evaluation with it. And please make sure to submit your feedback within one business day. So this will complete your CME activity. And then only you will get the CME credit. And this feedback is very important so that we can evaluate our lectures and we can also plan future talks based on your uh, evaluation and suggestions. Uh, thank you again, uh, Dr. Dahl. And uh, I would see that what two questions we have. One second. Oh. Okay, so I see one question, Dr. Dahl. Uh, the question is, in the female genital tract, we consider P53 diffuse cytoplasmic staining as positive as well. So is it the same in the GI tract? You mentioned diffuse cytoplasmic staining? Yes, diffuse cytoplasmic staining. Wow, I, I, I don't think I've heard of that. Um, um, to me, um, I do GYN as well. Um, Maybe, maybe uh, I'm trying to think if there was cyto. Yeah, I I don't know about. I think if if that is the case, it is it is to be rare uh, scenario. Like in in both GYN and GI, it's to me it's a diffuse homogeneous. Yeah, I think I'm remembering that there, there is a piece of literature where say even cytoplasmic staining. Actually, what you are saying is the null pattern of staining. So how about this? It either needs to be diffuse nuclear positivity or diffuse homogeneous strong staining to be called P53 as a mutant pattern staining or a null pattern staining, where you shouldn't be seeing any nuclear staining uh, in comparison to normal. And about cytoplasmic positivity, I have to check myself. I think I'm vaguely remembering there is, a, uh, there is some literature about it, but 
I have not seen cases like that. So to me, it's either strong diffuse positivity or it's null pattern of staining, total negativity in the nuclei. All right. No, thank you. So I think there was a question already about the null pattern of staining. So how do you read the null pattern of staining and how do you actually compare with the adjoining uh, uninvolved mucosa? So remember, uninvolved mucosa and the stromal cell, they will always show some sort of staining, weak staining, focal staining, patchy staining. If your internal control, if your normal colonic mucosa, what you think is normal, or stromal cells are not staining for P53, then you cannot call it null pattern staining. So I, I, I find it sometimes it's hard in the biopsy material. So if you have convincing background internal control with weak staining, and then you see your lesional cells with totally blue stain, not, no, no brown at all, then you can comfortably say null pattern. And sometimes you can say suggestive of null pattern in the biopsy. I know it can be tricky in smaller biopsies, but it, it is a well-known phenomenon and uh, it can be seen that pattern in a biopsy. You have to have a good internal control to diagnose that. Right, thank you. So uh, there is another question on the similar line. Let me find that. Uh, so the question is uh, about, uh, so I was taught that you need diffuse positive P53 at the surface to definitely diagnose low-grade dysplasia in both IBD and Barrett's. Is this no longer correct? <laughs> um, you know, there's a modern pathology paper in 2021 from Dr. Daniel Hirsch. Um, you can look at that paper. Uh, it was published last year, Daniela Hirsch from Hopkins it's, uh, and, and from Germany. I, I don't think I don't think you need to have surface P53 positivity. And uh, because many times in my experience, when you see these dysplasia cases, the surface is gone for some reason, or there's some funny surface maturation. And all the examples I've shown you, to me, you don't see surface positivity in that. And morphologically, I'm quite comfortable with the diagnosis of dysplasia. So I, and again, to me, it's, P, it's is nothing required about it because as, remember in uh, in that multi-institutional study, they found less than 50% of cases with P53 positivity. So if morphologically it's dysplasia, for you it's dysplasia. And if you want a P53 support, if you see in the majority of the crypt access, it doesn't have to be on the surface with strong homogeneous staining, I think I'm comfortable to call it mutant pattern staining if there is a morphological support. So if the one case I showed you, which was diffusely atypical and we did not call it dysplasia because P53 was wild type, but see it was, so I, I, I yeah, I, I don't think you need to have surface P53 changes to call something as this, to have a supportive evidence that for dysplasia. Right. No, thank you again, Dr. Dahl. Here is another interesting question that uh, you have talked about IBD-related dysplasia mostly associated with ulcerative colitis. What is your experience about uh, dysplasia in Crohn's disease when it is involving small bowel? I mean, so dysplasia in case, small bowel. So the last case I showed you was Crohn's disease. There was right. a stricture and there was a carcinoma and dysplasia. And yeah, it's interesting, right? We talk about, we've seen the literature, there's similar duration, like similar uh, incidents of colorectal carcinoma in both UC and Crohn's, and yet we always have these examples of uh, ulcerative colitis. I don't know an answer, but I have seen a subset of Crohn's. I at least remember two, three cases of Crohn's disease stricture with uh, carcinoma and dysplasia. I think Maybe UC is more common incidence-wise. If you compare with Crohn's disease, more patients have UC than Crohn's disease. And I, it's my observation too, I see more patients with UC, but according to the literature, there's a similar risk of uh, developing dysplasia. Uh, I have to say that the non-conventional dysplasia we talk about in that multi-institutional study, most majority of them were UC patients and majority of those were lesions in the left colon. Um, and in the serrated uh, category, the, the serrated changes we were talking about, those were also uh, at a higher risk of dysplasia in their study in UC patients. So yes, there is more talk about UC patients, but 
there is no there is no doubt that Crohn's disease patients also get dysplasia and cancer. So, what is your experience about uh, uh, dysplasia in small bowel in Crohn's disease? No, that was that was a small bowel. Okay. I, okay. I, that that was terminal ileal. There was a terminal ileal stricture. It was a small bowel cancer. Yeah, yeah. I okay. think it's rare. I think I see more in UC. But I, I didn't find that in literature. So I have to, we have to figure out in the literature what's there, out there. My experience is more with UC. Okay. So then let me go to the next question. So this is about, uh, we are frequently seeing focal areas of regenerative changes with pyloric foveolar metaplasia in cases of inflammatory bowel disease. So is this different from hypermucinous dysplasia? See, that's what I was telling you. I think hypermucinous changes, if you really look, and if you know about this entity, you find it too. You start, you start seeing foveolar epithelium. I showed you that inflammatory polyp with the foveolar epithelium. So, I, so that's why. When do you think that foveolar epithelium is hypermucinous dysplasia? To me, it, you have to see HAPR, especially at the base. Um, and then... If it's a lesion, you know, they're, they're, they're more than 50% actually of them are polypoid. They are visible lesions, but a subset of them are invisible. To me, you have to see evidence of morphologic atypia, at least in some areas, particularly at the crypt basis, to call something as hypermucinous dysplasia. Otherwise, you can say hypermucinous epithelium and if you really think it's reactively generated, you can let it go. If you are a little nervous and you can always say indefinite for dysplasia, or you can say some investigators, um, um, it's, although this can be seen in reactive epithelium, it, uh, hypermucinous dysplasia has been described and follow-up is recommended, appropriate clinical follow-up. But my feeling is if you don't see atypia, if you don't see a, uh, a, a different area from the background, um, and your P53 is not helpful, better to don't overdiagnose things. Just flag it as indefinite and you will get more biopsies and you will get a final answer as I showed you in my examples. Thank you again, Dr. Dahl. Uh, so here is one question about P53 that uh, as we are aware that, I mean, not uh, there is still a little bit of a debate and preference about using P53 by even GI pathologists across institutions, right? I and uh, you have worked in different places. So what is actually your experience uh, with P53 as a reliable, like you know, in your practical experience that you can actually rely on P53 in a diagnosing IBD-related dysplasia? So I will tell you, I, I totally agree with that comment. If you ask GI pathologists, some will say, I will never do it. Some people are doing it out of uh, uh, academic practice. And I uh, decided to give this talk six months ago. So it, it, was, it became my interest to see, let, let's see if this is P53 positive or not. Um, I think um, if uh, because of these non-conventional phenotypes, uh, the crypt cell dysplasia, the goblet cell deficient, the hypermucinous thing, it's not, if you're, if you're not seeing this every day, you might very calmly just pass this case, ah, the reactive changes. Um, I look at them carefully and sometimes I'm convinced there's atypia and uh, I have a GI subspecialty practice. All of us are GI pathology trained and it, it's, it's hard for me to, uh, to prove it to them as dysplasia. And once I show them P53 and we use that for parrots, and for some reason, if it's atypical, and if you see diffuse P53 staining, it makes you, it, it's a good support. Um, and especially when we know P53 mutation is an early event. So if you are really worried, if you think it is dysplasia, to me, it's a good support to have. But if you see, if you're really worried, and if P53 is wild type, I would still be worried because P53 is not 100%. And regarding in rare cases, when, when I showed you this, I specifically showed you that paper that in ischemic bowel, regenerative epithelium can be P53 positive. Yes, I think the last, the one, one of the case I showed you, it could, you, could, could, you could go wrong. I don't know about that. So I, I would not say no, no, P53 positive dysplasia. And a lot of literature is coming. And the most recent literature I'm aware of is published in Modern Pathology about P53. 
uh, and people do P53 in Barrett's. And at least all GI pathology, uh, pathology faculty here, and all of us are trained at different places. We all are doing P53. So it may vary from places to places. And you can, uh, no matter what you learn from your uh, from your mentors, I still, I still feel start in your practice. You will know it yourself. And if you won't do it, you won't know whether how useful it is. But always be careful if there's ulceration, if patient does not have long-standing IBD, if patient does not have concurrent PSC, you know, look at high risk factors, look at prior biopsies and flag it as indefinite. If, you know, I, I would not, if I do, if I'm worried about something and if I have P53 positive, I would not call it reactive. I would, I would say I'm concerned and I would wait for a three month or a six month follow up biopsy. And I've shown you some examples. There was one, so I, I, anyway, I'm not a very IHC person. Oh, histology is always the gold standard. It's the histology, history, proper communication, going back deeper sections, and then is P53. Thank you. So there is another question about, uh, again, on the similar note, that what is your practical advice to people like, you know, when there is uh, without immunostain, that when there is inflammation in that area and you are debating about uh, diagnosing low-grade dysplasia on that biopsy, so how do you actually uh, approach the case? Which inflammation, without inflammation, what are the caveats and how, what are the practical tips to uh, signing out pathologists? Okay, I agree. Remember, I was showing you the criteria for indefinite for dysplasia. So, and that's why I spent some time for indefinite for dysplasia. Yes, we should not make a waste basket diagnosis of indefinite for dysplasia. I think if you see atypia and if it's very inflamed, always have a very high threshold. If it's inflamed, very active, ulcerated, if you, atypia is common, right? So, first of all, uh, always have some sort of a GI consensus conferences. If everybody thinks this ATPI is bothersome, mm. then, and it's very, airy, it's very ulcerated, then you say ATPI, and they say this ATPI is very bothersome. However, there's ulceration in the adjacent mucosa. And um, so this best considered indefinite for dysplasia. Indefinite for dysplasia means I don't know if it's reactive or dysplasia. You don't have to be a hero if you think. It is, it is very atypical. It is really bothering you to say this is reactive. And you don't have to be here or saying this is dysplasia. So you can always have a consensus conference, say there's atypia. You may not even say indefinite for dysplasia, say atypia. Clinicians won't like it, but you can discuss it with them at the, at the, at the GI conference and show them this is what is bothering you. And, um, and if, of course, when there's not much inflammation, Atypia is much more significant. Um, but sometimes the patients had recent colitis and was recently had ulcerated colitis. And then you, let's say you get immediate biopsy after six weeks, you may be dealing with a lot of regenerated mucosa and you may not have much inflammation. This is a very difficult topic. So um, to, to me, it's just, you know, deeper sections show to your colleagues do P53 in cases, especially when there's not much inflammation. Um, even with inflammation, I in, in my IBD display, I often see inflammation. So, you know, the, all the usual criteria, sometimes they are not true for IBD cases. I've seen surface maturation, I've seen a lot of inflammation. You just have to be convinced either way and just don't come in. Say a TPI and say they were reactive, or say I, I don't know, it's indefinite, or um, say what is some for dysplasia. All right. No, thank you. This is very helpful. I think our viewers might have noticed that you have pointed out that there can be surface maturation, number one. There can be a lot of inflammation, but if it is atypical, so you have to be worried. And if you're not sure, so around and still not sure, so you can still call it indefinite, right? And remember, we are not just talking about mild atypia. It has to be significant, mm -hmm. atypia, right? And I, to me, comparison with normal really helps. If I have a normal mucosa, which is also very inflamed and it's not uh, atypical enough, and then I've, so, you know, I always compare with background mucosa. Right. Thank you, Dr. Dahl. There is another question about uh, your practical experience in using Amacar in huh. dysplasia. Yeah, I know. There was, I was thinking to talk about Amacar. I know we all have Amacar as an immuno panel in, for prostate cancer. I think when the papers came, we used to do Amacar. And in that paper, they talked about its high specificity. 
So if you have indefinite foot dysplasia, you're not sure if it's MFR positive, then it's highly likely that it's going to be dysplastic. I think when the papers came, we did in some cases, we didn't get very, uh, we were not sure and uh, uh, we don't do it. And I would love to hear from people who are doing it, who have experience about it. And I would also love to hear from anybody who's attending this lecture who, who has different ideas than me um, or dif if, if disagree with me. It, it's nice to know. I think everything is, everything can change, you know, the, the, <laughs> It's, it's, it's always research, what we can do in prospective studies, what we can prove and uh, all that stuff. But yeah, I have no experience with Amakar. I We stopped doing it at some point and I have, I've seen even in talks uh, from the, like one time Dr. Pai and other people I've heard, I, I don't think they talked about Amakar. Um, I don't think anybody talks about Amakar these days. So we can do it as a research project again, but no, I'm not aware of. There is paper, but I, I have not much experience with that. All right. So there is another question uh, regarding serrated sages. Uh, the question is, is it better to report cases with serrated epithelial changes as indefinite for dysplasia? And if the serrated changes are associated with dysplasia, then should we report this as other serrated lesions? I'm not sure if I could uh, read that question well. So, um, no, other serrated lesions is only meant for those serrated lesions where you cannot classify them as society serrated lesion or traditional serrated adenoma. Now, I've seen some IBD dysplasia case, and I've shown you one. It looks serrated, and I think those can be very tricky. So first, in any serrated epithelium, you have to look for dysplastic features, like what we talk about. If we are convinced it's dysplasia, then... I'm, I'm kind of forgetting the question. So yeah, you have to figure out dysplasia in a serrated polyp. And that's significant. That's a risk for subsequent development of higher risk lesion. And what was the other half of it, uh, um, uh, Rifat? I'm, uh, I'm, I'm forgetting. Yeah, the question is, if the serrated changes are associated, Dysplastic, associated dysplastic changes, should we report this as other serrated lesions? No, no, no. So you should not report other, you should just say serrated changes with dysplasia, but you have to be sure about dysplastic changes. And right. about so the serrated changes I'm talking about, I am myself struggling morphologically uh, in some cases. I don't want, I don't want too many, I personally don't want too many diagnoses of indefinite for dysplasia. The clinicians go mad. I don't think we are ready to call that that as indefinite for dysplasia yet. Uh, we have done in the past. If it really bothers you, we can say you can say serrated changes. Sometimes I've said serrated slash hyperplastic changes, and then discuss at the uh, at the conference again and say you know some studies say these serrated changes may is uh, is a higher risk for developing dysplasia. But remember. Remember, all these patients are actually undergoing endoscopy every one to two years, right? And so anyways, the patient is going to come back in one year. And so far, I don't think the literature has proven that this patient had serrated epithelial change and in one year developed high grade dysplasia. So I think it's okay to mention serrated change. If it bothers you um, in some areas, which is very different, you can say it and you can quote those papers from Dr. Parian. Uh, but make sure you're, if it's matching with your criteria, uh, the matching with the histologic criteria, and say uh, some would consider this as indefinite for dysplasia. Right. No, thank you again, Dr. Dahl. I think uh, we have come to the end of the Q&A session, and uh, thank you for your patience and answering to all the questions from our viewers. And Dr. Dahl, you will be happy to know that we had... Uh, Many viewers, I think over 100 from several countries, and I could keep a track. Uh, I saw viewers who joined from places as far as Thailand, Egypt, Nigeria, Bolivia, Mexico, uh, India, Ukraine, uh, South Africa, uh, amongst other places. And thanks to our viewers for joining today's lecture and uh, supporting Patrika. So if you like our lectures, please don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow the Facebook page on Patrika. And you can also find the lectures on uh, our website that is pathologicast.com. 
And uh, once again, if you want to get CME credit for today's lecture, please don't forget to send the code to the email address that is there and also to the phone number. You can text it if you are watching it from the United States. And uh, our next lecture will be on October 4th. So we are moving to pediatric pathology and somewhat related to GI, of course, that our topic will be on Hirschsprung's disease, another very important topic for practicing pathologists all over the world. And our speaker will be uh, Dr. Vijay Joshi. He is a very prominent pediatric pathologist. Hope to see you then. It would be again on October 4th, uh, 12 p.m. Eastern time. And thank you again, all of you. And thank you, Dr. Dahl, for joining us today. Thank you very much for listening.